dirty until for today. So, uh, students, so if you are taking the EC uh, 496 or 691 for credit, make sure that you um, rename yourself in the Zoom participant like uh, list um, so that I can have your name correctly recorded for attendance tracking. Also, the attendance has been posted on the uh, my UTK attendance tracking. So uh, make sure that you check it regularly and see if it reflects your latest attendance. Okay, uh, I'll usually like uh, take a screenshot of the attendance list around like 1230. So make sure you're not blocked out at that time. So um, today we are really glad to have Dr. Leon Tolbert to give the seminar. And the title is Writing an Effective IEEE Paper. So uh, Dr. Leon Tolbert is the Engineered Systems Testbed Leader in Current and the Mingkao Professor and Chancellor's Professor in UT's Department of EECS. Dr. Tolbert is also an adjunct participant at the Oak Ridge National Lab. He is a registered professional engineer in the state of Tennessee and an IEEE fellow. He received his BS in electrical engineering with highest honors in 1989, followed by his MS and PhD in electrical engineering in 1991 and 1999, all from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Tolbert's area of research interest include high efficiency electric power conversion for data centers, application of wide band gap powered devices, multi-level converters, electric vehicles, renewable energy interfaces, microgrids, and other utility application of power electronics. So in the chat box, I see a few likes for your background and your t-shirt, but I believe students will most likely end your presentation when they finish this. So let's turn the presentation uh, to Dr. Tober. Okay, thank you. Um, obviously without pizza, seems like attendance gets hurt just a little bit, but I'm glad that you all are here and I'm sure there'll be a few takeaways uh, from today's talk that will uh, allow you to have better papers and, and hopefully improve acceptance rates too. Highlighter. Ooh. There we go. So I did want to dedicate uh, today's seminar to Dr. Han Dong Wei. Uh, he died unexpectedly this summer, um, but I did want to point out he was one of my best at writing papers. A uh, very talented writer, wrote many, many conference papers and probably uh, as many as I've known, at least of my students, journal papers. He had six as a first author uh, during his time at, at UT. <clears throat> so excellent writing, uh, it's important. Uh, <clears throat> I think some people, uh, if you write quite a few papers, you'll be kind of known by your paper. It's what gives you visibility. And so obviously you want to put that best foot forward, best uh, impression if that's how people know you from your paper. They want to know you from, hey, that's nice work, really well written as opposed to, well, that was kind of sloppy and thrown together. Um, if you're an MS student and you have a paper or two, it's gonna improve your chance of, of getting accepted into a PhD program. But more importantly, uh, for our PhD students, it's very important uh, when you're applying for academic position, professor type positions, because that's that seems to be the very first thing uh, they look at is, is your papers and how many are first authored and where are they. Uh, but just in general, writing is, is good for your career, even if you don't go into academia. Um, regardless of your job, you're gonna find out you do a whole lot more writing than you thought you would. 
you think I'm an engineer, it's all going to be about calculations and simulations, but uh, there's going to be a lot of writing. Uh, and the other reason you want to do a good job with your writing is, is these things stay around forever. And so again, uh, you, you want to do a good job. Let's first talk about authorship and how IEEE defines authorship. IEEE says you need to do all of these three things. You need to, to be the author of the paper, to have made some uh, significant intellectual contribution. You need to help in writing it, or at least as a minimum, reviewing and revising it. Uh, and you need to kind of keep up with that process and, and say, yeah, that, that looks good uh, before the, the final paper gets turned in. If you are the, the corresponding author, which typically means you're the first author, uh, but not necessarily, but if you're the corresponding author, your main job is to kind of keep all the other co-authors in the loop. Uh, you need to make sure you include people who did contribute and if, and if somebody didn't really contribute, you don't necessarily just stick them on because it would be nice. Um, so the authors on it should have contributed in some form or fashion. Um, and, and they should be aware of this paper. They should be given a chance to review the paper. Uh, they should be kind of kept in the loop on the, the review cycle and be able to comment and contribute along the way. Um, and, and just in terms of kind of how it works, uh, especially if you have lots of authors, you need to kind of very quickly identify who's going to be a co-author, let them know, Hey, I need you to provide me a figure here or a table, or could you write this section? Uh, be sure to review this when we send it out. Um, you need to kind of tell them what schedule you're looking at so that when they receive it, they know, okay, I need to get something to them within a, a week or a day or you know a timeline uh, some tools help in this process so that it's not as having to go back and forth back and forth so things like Google Docs and Overleaf kind of help people work on things simultaneously um, be sure to in some cases some of our work uh, we have to get permission uh, I know I've had uh, projects that basically Boeing had to approve uh, before we uh, published it or I've had projects where Department of Energy or or someone else they said we want to approve it before it's published and if that's the case you be sure to get that approval and you be sure to cite who funds your work and acknowledgments this is very important too ORCID or ORCID uh, it's basically a, a unique identifier. It's almost like a social security number uh, for you as a researcher. Uh, almost everywhere now when you publish, whoever submits it, they want an ORCID ID. So be sure to get one. If you don't have one, you can go to this website, orchid.org, to, to register and get one. And, and of course, it's not something you just kind of pass around. It, it belongs to you. Uh, some other considerations. Uh, I think most people know not to plagiarize, and, and that's certainly the case with papers. Um, IEEE screens every submission for plagiarism. They use a tool to kind of check to, to make sure. Certainly, there's many times overlap with the own author's previous work, and as long as you're citing your previous work, that's fine. Uh, but you should not be, you know, copying uh, words and figures from other papers without citing them. Be sure you cite everything uh, that you've read and contributed to. Um, and and I triple is aware that a lot of times you may publish something initially here, and then you may add more to it for a conference, and then finally in a journal, add some more. Uh, that's that's kind of how our work is done, uh, but be sure to cite these previous works uh, as you go along and, and kind of indicate what did you add 
in this new new version so that reviewers know what's new. IEEE has an author center. Um, the web page up here is IEEE author center .org. I encourage everybody to go look at it. It's got some uh, tools. It's got some paper templates for journal and conference. A lot of people don't realize these two are actually a little bit different. They're very close, but not quite identical. The other thing I want to encourage you is to, when you decide which IEEE transaction or journal you want to submit it to, you need to be sure to know what what's unique about that particular one. All IEEE transactions are not the same. Each one has some subtle difference. Um, for instance, in, in our field, uh, transactions on industry applications, you, you have to have submitted it in a conference first and then edit it before you submit it to the transactions. And so when you submit it, you have to tell them which conference did I already present this, uh, which is a little unique. Power Electronics, it can be brand new or it could be a conference revision. Um, Power and Energy Society, they have several transactions and it. Typically, they, they want it to be brand new or a significant addition, not just a little bit, but it has to be quite a bit different. And for that reason, they typically have limited their conference papers to be pretty short to kind of force people to add quite a bit when they submit it as a transactions paper. There is a, a trend now to open access journals. I think uh, for, I'll say multiple reasons. Uh, I think some funders have gotten irritated that they paid thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars for research and then other people can't read about it unless they pay a fee to download the article. And, and so they're requiring things to be open access. Uh, and, and I think it just helps that, that this is more openly available for others to read. Uh, so IEEE is, I'll say a little bit later than some to the game because they make a lot of money through IEEE Explore, but uh, they, they are now, offering lots of IEEE open access journals that started basically in 2020. Uh, they have this open journal of power electronics, industry applications, power and energy. Our very own Dr. Fran Lee is the first editor in chief of this journal. Um, what's different about these is that of course, open access means anybody can look at it. They don't have to pay a fee. They don't have to be an IEEE member. Uh, so more likely people are gonna see your work, which is a good thing. Uh, did wanna point out though, that most of these still have page limits. So open access doesn't mean I can write a, as long of an article as I feel like. It still means typically you need to keep it around eight pages. Uh, but again, each one's a little unique. Um, at least Power Electronics says, if you're gonna go past eight, you need to provide a written explanation of why you need so many pages. Uh, and then they will either say, yeah, that's okay, or they'll say, sorry, you need to cut it down to eight. I do wanna point out here at the bottom, just IEEE Access. Um, it's been around several years, but it has no page limit. So it's a little unique in that aspect. And so maybe if you did have something that was a little longer than normal, that might be something you wanna consider. IET journals. I know several people publish in the IET, uh, which is a European uh, out of the UK. Um, these have been cross-listed on IEEE Explorer for many years but they've decided to kind of change how they do things starting in January. They're transitioning to open access. And so all of their articles will be available 
through this IET engineering technology hub on the Wiley online library. And they're going to go back and some of these articles since 2013 put them as well. Uh, their charges aren't cheap though. They're anywhere from 2200 to 3200. Again, I don't quite understand why one journal has to cost a thousand dollars more than another. Um, but I guess each one was able to set whatever rate they wanted. Acceptance rates. I know at least in the journals we typically publish in IEEE transactions on power electronics and uh, emerging uh, selected and emerging topics in power electronics and most of our our journals acceptance rate is somewhere in this 30 to 40 percent uh, overall I think at UT we have a much higher acceptance rate for two or three reasons um, one is we do good work the other is we uh, we know how to write good papers and and I think all of you have very good advisors and and helping to edit and make sure that it's uh, in pretty good shape. So I think as a group, our acceptance rate is, is much, much higher than this. Um, but it's, it's not 100% and it's not 90%. So uh, don't feel bad if something's not accepted. I've had many, many papers get not accepted. I'm not happy about it, but uh, I typically say, okay, what do we need to do to improve it? Conference papers, acceptance rates are higher. Um, they're typically in our societies somewhere in this 60% to 70% range. Um, I do want you to know that most papers are reviewed by anywhere from two to five people. However, I've noticed some of these open access journals, they've been reviewed by like eight. I don't know if this is something they're doing at the beginning or something they plan to do all along, but eight reviewers, I, I thought that's actually a few too many. Um, and, and really your paper, you could have three people like it and one really not like it and they end up rejecting it based on the, the one who doesn't like it. Um, but in any event, uh, it takes about three months typically from time of submission to get uh, a decision, uh, which is much better than it used to be, I'll say in the old days when it could take six months, 12 months. Um, if you turn in something that's just sloppy, doesn't look good, uh, poorly written, it's very easy to reject it. Reviewers time is precious. And they just feel irritated if they get a paper that just seems like it's thrown together. Um, now you can greatly improve your chances by putting something together. I always like to say if it looks like a transactions paper, it's more likely to be accepted. So if everything's formatted nicely and meets everything, it's just more likely to be accepted. Also, if you're asked to review, you should review papers, especially as, as students. It's, it's good to see what other people are doing, helps you keep up with the literature. And I also call it's kind of payback because other people have to review your papers. So you should, you should also have to review other papers. Uh, as I mentioned, write, and format and and be sure to follow whatever their formatting requirements are this is not a time to be creative um, this is a time to follow exactly what they say most today are doing the the double column single space meaning uh, it kind of looks like the published version uh, earlier uh, they used to a lot of times do single column double space to kind of make it a little easier to read and, and proof and that kind of thing. But I've got, the trend has been more to double column, single space, but be sure to check whatever it is and be sure to follow 
also make sure you do your figures and tables, equation, section, font size, font type, all of that. Follow whatever it is. Do not exceed page limitations. If they say the page limit is eight and you submit a 15 page paper, I can guarantee your chance is pretty low of it being accepted. Um, now, if, if the page limit is eight and you want to do nine or 10, it's might can get by, but realize after reviewer comments, you end up adding a page or two and with author biographies and other page or two. And before you know it, you have a 14, 15 page paper, even if you start out with eight or nine. This last bullet, uh, at least in power electronics societies, a lot of our conferences, we submit digests, which I call is half a paper. Uh, but be sure to mention what additional material you plan to include in the final paper. I know it's not in this digest, but you need to say, in the final paper, we will include additional experimental results showing the efficiency over a wide load range. Uh, in the final paper, we will include a more detailed simulation results for uh, indicating how it, this uh, converter topology works during dynamic transition from on state to off state. But just mention what additional things you'll include. Otherwise, when reviewers will say, well, they didn't talk about this, this, and this. And yeah, you can't put all that in a digest, but if you say, I am going to put it in, then they'll say, okay, yeah, they're, they're going to include that. Logistics. Uh, it's a good idea to talk to your advisor, of course, when you're considering a, a writing a paper and talk to he or she about uh, which conference or which journal you, you plan to submit it to. Uh, be sure to have your student co-authors review and edit it before you send it to the professors. Um, we're very busy. Uh, I know you're putting a lot of effort into your paper, but I mean, there are some of these conferences where we've got a dozen papers to review. And so it's, it takes a lot of time and the better shape it's in before you give it to us, uh, it allows us to do, I call a better review. Uh, and give us time, please. Uh, you know, don't, don't send, send a paper on Friday at five o'clock and say, oh, by the way, professor, this is due at midnight tonight. Uh, would you please edit it and submit it for me? And I wouldn't say that if that hadn't happened. Um, so do you think I, I don't have anything better to do and spend my Friday evening editing your paper and submitting it. Um, so I'm just saying, be considerate of your professors. Um, again here, be sure to cite your previous work. UT is a subscriber to something called Authenticate. It's a good idea for you to use Authenticate to check your thesis dissertation and your papers before you submit them, just to make sure there wasn't something in there that you inadvertently copied. Uh, again, you shouldn't be caught, you should be writing things. Also, be sure to send your final versions to all the authors. Because um, a lot of times we have to submit these to other funding agencies and stuff and, and they want these final versions. Be sure to do a, a literature review and discuss what others have done uh, in, uh, in that particular area. It's okay to have some overlap with your other papers, but it, it needs to be not too much. Um, and try to write new abstracts, of course, and not recycle too much. Um, but be sure to cite your related work be sure to follow the guidelines in terms of paper length. And, and again, it's good to have an outline and talk to your advisor what you plan to include in your paper. 
you don't really have to put new or novel in your title of your paper because most everything you're doing should be new or novel. Make your title descriptive, but not too long. Uh, I've you know run into where people want to say something like simulation analysis and experimental testing of a multi-level converter for electric vehicles. Well, you don't need to put simulation analysis and testing in the title. Um, that that's just not needed. So, but you know, think about the title. Uh, the title needs to be good so that when people are searching uh, for some related material, they'll come across your title. So be sure to put those keywords in there. Your abstract, you need to highlight what's new or significant in what you've done. You don't just kind of say, here's what I've done, but you need to say, you know, this is a uh, uh, more efficient than previous converters of this topology or or this, this technique allows us to reduce the size by 30% over what's available today. So, and, and be sure if you've done experimental work, particularly in power electronics, put that in the abstract so they, they know that. Be sure to write that abstract really well because a lot of times when people are searching, right? When you search in IEEE Explorer, you can see the title and you can see the abstract for free. And then you have to pay if you're not an IEEE member and uh, for that paper. And, and so be sure to have a good abstract. Literature review. Um, I think it's a lot harder to do literature review today than it was when I was a student. And I think the reason I say it's a lot harder is because there is a proliferation of publications that exist today that, that didn't exist, uh, let's say, 30 years ago. Um, way too many papers to have to go through to figure out what do I need to actually concentrate on. I had the opposite problem of couldn't find any papers because there weren't that many. There was no IEEE Explorer. Uh, had to go to the library and just kind of check through each issue or, or there were some printed materials that you could kind of search through to find stuff. But believe me, it was not easy. Um, but I think the tough today is, you know, you do a search, well, you may come across 500 papers. So you got to figure out how to narrow it down I try to kind of look through the title. Title's not as good of a hint as, as looking through the abstract. Um, and you'll still end up reading lots of papers that turn out either not to be very good or just wasn't as relevant as you thought. It's a good idea too to talk to your professor about who else has done work in this area because many times they may know. You'll also find that uh, typically you'll need in your, uh, when you write a paper, you'll probably have 20 to 40 that you list in your reference, which again, uh, I'd say a long time ago, we would probably put 10 to 20. So it's just, again, there's a lot more papers published today. Experiments, I, I keep saying, are good. Uh, a lot of our transactions require experiments. It's hard to get a paper accepted without it. Um, be sure to describe your experimental setup. You need to talk about the ratings of the different things and what all you used, and a table typically works pretty well for that. I think a picture of your hardware many times is, is good. It kind of it's again proof that you did build something. Uh, it's good to include waveforms, but be sure they're clear and labeled very clearly. It's again good to kind of do like a before or after or a side-by-side -side comparison, silicon versus silicon carbide, uh, silicon versus gallium nitride, and things like that. 
<clears throat> and again, yeah, be sure to label your, that this is experimental results when you're labeling your figures. <clears throat> and, and you should, you know, make judicious use of figures and tables. Uh, engineers, we like figures and tables. Uh, we don't like words quite so much. So figures and tables are great uh, and they need to, but don't just throw a figure in there and not talk about it in the text. This is one of my, my main pet peeves is people will put figures in and they'll just say, we built this prototype and tested it at different values, see figures 10 through 15. And that's all they say. That's not even close. You need to describe each figure individually within the text and tell them what's important about it. You know, tell them, notice there, this is a higher efficiency at lower power levels and the efficiency falls off. And, and you may say, well, they can see that from the graph. I'm like, so what? You need to spell it out. Do not make the reader draw their own conclusions. You draw the conclusions for them. Be sure that these uh, text labels can be read. I know many people are trying to squeeze things down to fit page limits, but I should not have to pull out a magnifying glass to read the labels and you say, oh, on your computer, you can zoom it in and all that. Again, don't make it too tiny. Color is very good now. Um, again, this is something we didn't have color in our printed stuff and computer stuff. And I think color helps uh, see things. And so, yeah, do a good job with your color. I have occasionally seen where somebody colorized things too much where it, it looked more like some sort of painting than some engineering thing. Um, so don't overdo it. It is good to highlight things in your tables. Um, if there's a particular thing you want to highlight, well, you know, shade it in a little bit. And I'll say this again, use correct captioning and formatting. So these are just uh, some examples, not necessarily the best I've seen, but some things I think help to show. For instance, let me just go through some of the formatting. Notice, <clears throat> at least this particular journal, it's capital F, I, G, period, space, number, period, space, first letter capital, everything else lowercase and then a period at the end. So you need to look at the journal you're planning to submit to, just get an article and follow. Again, my fourth grader, I could tell her to follow this formatting and she could. You college students, you ought to be able to do that, but I've not seen as many do it as I would hope. Same thing with table. Notice capital T. Table, space, number, period, space, capital, everything else, and then period. So be sure to follow whatever the, the formatting requirements are. Notice here, the thing I like here is there is color to kind of associate things with like stray inductance. Um, there's, there's color to show positive and negative and a different color to show neutral, so, uh, you know, kind of judicious use of color. Here they use color, but notice there's no label. No label here, no label here, so need to put some labels. <clears throat> Here's an experimental figure. What I like about it is it's, it, there's some labels on it, an arrow kind of pointing to what's what. It's fine to stick a figure in and not label it, but I think adding these labels really does help the reviewer kind of know what's what. Um, again, you're intimately familiar with your work. You've worked on it many years. A reviewer 
has no idea what you've done. And so you've got to spill it out. The thing I like about this figure here on the right, notice uh, they're, they've labeled, they've tried to match the label to the color of whichever waveform it goes with and, and spell out the, the units. So again, I, I thought that was pretty good. Okay, writing style, um, you know, try to put most important stuff first, less later, delete unnecessary information. Uh, there's many times when I'm reading a paper, well, I, where I will delete an entire sentence, I will delete a paragraph, I will delete a figure, because it didn't really add much to it. Um, so putting too much can be just as bad as not putting enough. Um, some of you may know, but some may not, that uh, in high school, I was uh, worked on a high school newspaper. Uh, we had a very good high school newspaper. It was the, one of the top 10 in the United States. So I learned a lot about how to do things for a newspaper. And then in college, I was on uh, our college newspaper and was the sports editor. And so a lot of the lessons I learned through the newspaper business, I'll call it, um, apply to writing technical papers. Uh, whether it had to do with writing headlines or titles, how to caption pictures, uh, how to write in a way that conveys things fairly simply how to keep sentences and paragraphs short. Um, that's another thing I've found is many times paragraphs just way too long. And believe me, when people run into a very long paragraph, their attention span just runs out before to the end of the paragraph. So part of the reason you put in paragraph breaks is it kind of helps people mentally read, understand, and then move on to the next paragraph. And you say, well, but that whole paragraph was just one topic. It's like, so what? Break it up. So, so don't make your paragraphs too long. Do not ever use the word I or you in your papers. We, uh, it's okay. I prefer not to use it. I'll say, but it's, it's okay. This uh, bullet here about do not editorialize. There's a few folks that, that I call put a little bit too much opinion. You don't need to state opinion. It needs to be fact. So you don't need to say this is uh, very important. Uh, this greatly exceeds blah, blah, blah. Try to av avoid adverbs. Don't say the previous technology is no good. It probably was pretty good for whenever it was developed. And before you know it, people are gonna be writing about your technology. I don't think you want them talking about how your stuff was no good. Uh, so the other important thing down here at the bottom is be balanced. Students are always afraid to talk about the disadvantages or what didn't work. You need to spell it out because if you don't, the reviewers will. And if you will talk about your disadvantages, uh, then the reviewers know that you're being balanced in your comments. And I've heard from like industry say, oh, yeah, we like the, the papers by UT on wide band gap because they're pretty balanced in how they treat the subject. We talk about, yeah, silicon carbide is great and blah, 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 but we'll also say, but it has a few of this, this issue, that issue, uh, that kind of thing. So be balanced. Talk about advantages, but talk about disadvantages. The following are, are some tips. I'm probably gonna run through these pretty quick. Um, but again, when you're formatting, like in the text, you know, it should be 
FIG period space one, FIG period space two, parentheses around the A. Um, references, you put them inside the bracket, something like this right here. You don't say reference to, except at the very beginning of a sentence, you would say reference eight. You don't just put eight. Equations, you don't say equation, you just put it in parentheses, three, four, whatever, except again, at the beginning of a sentence, then you say equation eight. Again, this is for IEEE, other journals may be just a little different. Important here, you put the number, you put a space, you put the unit and you do it correctly, like these up here. You do not leave no space, not put a degree sign, kilohertz, or K in this case should be a lower K. Uh, symbols in the text many times are italicized, like here. Try to avoid using contractions, meaning do not use contractions. Spell it out. I found a lot of people have trouble with IT apostrophe S and ITS. Well, if you don't use contractions in your writing, you will not have a problem with it. Be sure to spell out your abbreviations. Again, uh, the journal editors, they're going to ask, if you don't, uh, you need to learn how to do commas uh, after introductory phrases. You need to know how to do commas. Here, I think there's some debate about whether you have to have a comma here before and. And you're listing three things, on resistance, higher blocking voltage, higher thermal conductance. I like to put a comma. I don't know that it's necessarily required but I think it just helps to separate things. Uh, it, it avoids confusion. If you have a compound sentence, you have to put a comma. Or you have a subject, verb, comma, and another subject, verb. These words here generally probably don't need to be in a paper. Big, good, bad, problem, got. I call some of these words are kindergarten words. Um, problem, I don't like writing about problems or the problem with this. I don't, problem just is a problematic word when it comes to your writing. So try to use something else. Instead of saying a lot, you can use several. Instead of problems, you could use issues or disadvantages. Analysis is a noun, analyzes a verb. Uh, folks, some folks have been trained to use firstly, secondly. I don't like it. it. Just doesn't sound right. Use first, second, sounds much better. People are trained to use the word besides. I think wrongly. Do not use besides. Besides essentially means however. And most of the time that's not how you, you intend to use it, I notice. Um, there's nothing wrong with using also or in addition. Those are fine. Much better than besides. Uh, do not be afraid to use the word because. Because is fine. Uh, I know some people try to avoid using because, and it just doesn't sound good. Unbalanced or unbalanced with UN is better than I am. Asymmetric is better than unsymmetric. In summary, certainly much better than to sum up. So back to a couple more things and then we'll be done. Be sure to cite uh, recent work. I mean, if, if you look and all of your references are 10 years old, 
are you really doing something new or is there, you know, why, why has nobody done anything in that area for the last 10 years? Um, it, it's, it's going to be odd. Certainly you better have a good reason. You don't have some recent references. Um, format your references properly. Another thing that really bugs me, there's an IEEE format. It's, just follow it. It's not something you need to get creative with. Here's one place where it's probably a little better to have too many than too few. I know reviewers get irritated if they think you should have referenced their work and you didn't. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of at least thinking IEEE Explore is uh, one of the main places to look for things, sure, but there are other journals. So, you know, don't just look only in IEEE. Look in these other, other journal, other search engines to find papers. This is showing the proper way to format things. Notice, first initial, last name, comma, comma, space, open quotes, first letter, capital, the rest of these are not capital, comma, inside the quotes, italics, the journal, it's also abbreviated, the volume, the issue number, the page numbers, the date. Same thing in a conference. One thing I've noticed in a conference, a lot of people will cite a conference and I'll see the year like three or four times. You only need it in there one time. Don't need it in there half a dozen times. So follow the format. Okay, once you've written a paper, is the first thing you do is, oh, I'm done. Let's send it to Dr. Tolbert. No. You need to print it. You need to review it. You need to send it to your other co-authors and they need to review it. You need to use spell check. You need to really spend time editing it. Um, and I can tell who has spent that effort and who has literally pushed the send key the second they finished writing. Um, so spend time proofing and editing it. Uh, it's important. It, it's what makes it read better. It, it fixes a lot of the issues. One thing I need to tell everybody and be careful, Microsoft Word many times does not check titles and section heads. So be sure to Check those individually. Down here at the bottom, and I think I kind of referred this earlier, is be sure to give your advisor sufficient lead time to review the paper. Um, and the better job you do before you give it to him or her, the easier it is uh, for us to concentrate on the technical part. If it's full of errors, um, it really makes it hard to focus on the technical part because we're just distracted by all these other errors. And then the, I believe is the last slide, citations. Some people have asked about citations. This basically indicates how many times a paper was cited or referenced. Um, it's something academia seems to pay a lot of attention to. So they've come up with some indices, things like H index and I-10 index, and I'm sure there's a few other indexes or indices. H index of 50 means that you've had 50 different papers cited 50 times each, which is actually quite a feat. Um, I-10 index just means was it cited at least 10 times. Journals have impact factors. Uh, 
the U.S. doesn't seem to pay a whole lot of attention to impact factors, but I have seen at least in Asian countries and Europe to some degree, they're all about impact factor, but I've also found there some games that journals play there for trying to show their high quality. You can look at some citations at Google Scholar and most highly cited papers are you know, they were basic, fundamental, uh, turned out to be kind of an area that a lot of people worked in, uh, but they're also, you know, written in a way people could understand. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tolbert, for the great presentation. And I believe uh, a lot more contents on, at the beginning, have been added after the last time I uh, listen to uh, this um, talk. So um, if there's any questions, students, you can raise your hand and ask for unmute or uh, unmute you. Or you can also type in the questions in the chat box. So I actually have one comment is that the last time I, I, I listened to this on talk, I remember that uh, the best way to prove a paper is to have it printed out and doing it on paper with a pen, which is the way, the perfect way that I like it. So on paper, I can feel that I can spot the errors and, and maybe bad flow in there. Some, something that I can hardly tell when I'm sitting in front of a monitor. Yes, I, I think we get, uh, well, I also say humans have been reading on paper at least several thousand years. We've been reading on computers maybe 30, and I just feel like our eyes work better on print on paper. And I know I can see things, uh, catch them in a print version that I don't catch uh, online. And, and so I encourage everybody, sure, you know, proofread multiple times on computer, but print it out. And again, you'll see things in a print version you don't see uh, on the computer. Perfect. Any other questions from students or audiences? Okay, I see, uh, I see if you're coming up. So from um, Bo Xin Xu. So may I ask if it is okay to share the slides in the chat, I think, Dr. Tobert? Yeah. If you like, uh, if, if it's shareable, then we can distribute it uh, within current, if you feel. Yeah, I'll, I'll send these to you and, and I think that's fine. Okay. And the next question is from Samen, S A M. A N E H. Sorry, I couldn't find your full name. So, shall we cite the abstract paper that are presenting as poster in conferences if it is not published as a paper? I guess from that perspective, I would only cite. I know there are some folks that literally. Um, they don't have a paper to accompany a poster. It's, it's as they said, an abstract. No, because a lot of times, if, if there's no way anybody can find it, meaning it's not an IEEE Explorer or anything like that, then I don't think it really makes much sense to cite it. Now, if, it, if the abstract is included, for instance, like in the conference proceedings somehow, uh, then it's okay to cite it. Um, but I probably, I probably would not unless it was uh, a, a paper. Okay. The next question is from uh, Xu Yao Wang. And the question is, can we use the author instead of I? Well, I don't know, uh, at least <laughs> the author, <laughs> I wouldn't even talk about the authors within a paper. Now you might talk about the author um, you can say the authors of a paper if you're talking in your literature review and it, and it happened to be you were one of the authors. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly don't use I. Um, and the next question is from Mashtava. And the question is, how can we find the conference paper is necessary for publishing journal. Yeah, I had mentioned like IEEE transactions on industry applications. 
Um, if you go to each of these journals' websites, uh, they, they should have the uh, methodology by which you have to submit and, and also what are the requirements, formatting requirements, and, and it's not always the easiest to find. Um, I know like transactions on industry applications, I probably only knew it because I attended those conferences and part of that society. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the time you can find it on the webpage, but not always. Okay, so uh, we have a few more coming up, but uh, let's try to finish them. So um, next question is from Thomas Williams, and what is the ideal way to format a paper, white text or a word editor? I know folks who like latex, um, and mostly because of the equations and, and how you, and I think it looks really nice. However, keep in mind, many times we have to share these papers with uh, funding agencies, DOE, Oak Ridge National Lab, other places, they are going to very much prefer Word. Um, they're not in, you know, LaTeX is, is mostly an academic uh, thing. So I typically try to stick to Word because of how we end up sharing it with others. Yeah, I agree with that. It, most of the time it depends on the collaborator. And uh, the the next question is from how you and I heard there's a type of paper called ladder. What is this? Is it the same as to digest or a different thing? I no, think a ladder that, is just a US ladder. Like that. No, they, they have letters like power engineering letters, power electronic oh. letters. It's it's a short paper, typically limited to three pages. Um, and it's very short uh, and you just include some result and, and I think many times those are appropriate and there usually aren't that many submissions to letters. Okay. And the Majitab has another question. So please give some hint about writing a review paper. That's a big topic. There. Yeah, review papers are tough. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things to do. I think it's also why I assign people in my classes typically have to write a review paper just for that practice uh, because you have to look at so many articles. I'll say the key is to you read a bunch, 50, 100, 150 articles. I also think you should print them out and write notes on them. You should write, this is a really good paper, or, or you should write, this paper stinks uh, as you're reading through it because you'll lose track of what's what. You need to kind of group things. You need to add a little bit of your own insight into a comparison, uh, pluses and minuses, um, but it's a tough thing to write. Okay. Let's answer the last question and it's from Zuhan Gao. That is, any comment on submitting to IEEE magazines? Yeah, I think IEEE magazines are tough. Um, I think a lot of times these are done by invitation. Uh, so typically you would want to talk to your advisor, supervisor again about if you thought this was appropriate for a magazine um, because they do typically have themes and, and a lot of times it's by invitation only. Uh, although sometimes they're just looking for articles. And uh, so you, I think it's a good idea to contact them before you even write it to say, hey, we would like to submit a paper on this topic. Is that something you would consider for your magazine? Or... Perfect. Thanks a lot, Dr. Tober. It's re we're really happy to have you share our thoughts on writing a technical paper. And I rem this is, we've got the most questions as far as I can recall. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Tobert, and thanks to everyone who are um, joining this um, seminar. Sure, appreciate it. Um, thank you, and no, see you next Friday. Oh. Are you going to post this video somewhere, for example, on current website? I think for those who didn't come today, it will be good to check it out sometime later, maybe. Yeah, video will be available. Um, uh, just like 
like we usually do for our seminars. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Thank you and goodbye. Bye, everyone.